Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 12 essential atonal or 12-tone works for beginners. Now, I know, I know that some people will look at that and just be horrified, say, oh my God, it's atonal. Ay, ay, ay. And for beginners, no, it's not for beginners. It's too difficult for beginners. Horseshit. That is complete, utter nonsense. First of all, nothing is too difficult for anybody. It all depends on the individual, as I've said a million times. What one person finds difficult, someone else might find absolutely entrancing because everybody is built differently. So that's number one. Number two, this fear of atonality or 12-tone music is just absurd. I mean, it's convenient because there's so much of it, and so much of it is bad and ugly, and we can hate it casually without bothering to pay any real attention to it, but it's a prejudice. It's a prejudice, plain and simple. The only kind of music we should hate is bad music, and that's all it is. There's good music and bad music. There's good atonal and bad atonal. And I'm showing you some really good atonal and 12-tone stuff. Now, there is a difference. First of all, let's talk about what is atonal music in the first place? You know, I mean, I remember reading with shock um, a statement by the great English musicologist and scholar Sir Donald Francis Tovey, who was talking about Hindemith, actually, um, a work by Hindemith, which he said was, you know, basically atonal, his Kammer Musik number no. one, which is a wonderful piece, by the way, um, not on this list, but that's okay. And, it's, and he said, those with atonal styles, such as Ravel, and I just said, wait a minute, Ravel? I mean, Ravel, I mean, it's like, you know, the pavan for a dead princess, that Ravel? Well, the truth of the matter is that atonal for Tovey simply meant anybody who did not follow the rules of classical tonal architecture as set forth by, you know, composers from, you know, Bach through Beethoven and, and, and Brahms. And so... And so effectively, Ravel, because Ravel does what he wants when he wants, even if it's gorgeous and mellifluous and euphonious, that's atonal. That is true. That is a point worth keeping in mind because atonal music simply means music that doesn't have a tonal center. That is, you can't say that one, one group of harmonies or a key area is home base where the music starts and to which it has to return. And, and what, that governs the range of harmonies that you'll encounter as you listen to it, as it develops and evolves throughout the piece. You know, anything that doesn't do that is effectively atonal. And you can write lovely, lovely, lovely music that is not tonal. There are other systems of tonality. There's modality, for example, like medieval and Renaissance music, which nobody would say is, is, you know, horrifying, but it's also not tonal in its, in its technique. It's a technical term in that sense. What we mean by atonal is something that usually sounds like crap. You know, it's dissonant. It's harsh. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. To the, to the extent that it expresses anything, what it expresses is horror, ugliness, nasty, miserable, you know, that's atonal music. Well, a lot of atonal music does express that because it happens to be very good at that because it's atonal. I mean, you know, it's easier to do to do nasty if you're doing a very high level of dissonance, which means, you know, you know, crunching chords that don't sound very stable. And and you know, so people used atonality when they wanted to express uh, you know, or get into expressionistic horror. And there's a lot of reasons to listen to music about it. You know, I mean, it's the same reason you go see a horror movie right? It's entertainment. It's wonderful entertainment. And it's, it's scary and spooky and atmospheric and, and spacey and, and totally, totally different from, you know, our normal experience. And it's out there. And I know a lot of people who would be very, very comfortable with that kind of music without giving it two thoughts, just because it's so cool sounding. And it is. It's fantastic sounding and brilliant. And, and, and the fact that it's spooky and creepy and scary is a plus, for many people. A lot of people simply want to listen to music that's relaxing and mellow, and then that's okay. And this isn't. But let's not criticize it for being what it never tries to be. No one says that you should be listening to atonal music of the type I'm going to describe because you want to relax and not pay serious attention to it. 
right? I mean, that's, that's not fair. It's not fair to the music. So that's one kind of this kind of music. 12-tone music is a little bit different because 12-tone or serial music, as it's called, uses various systems to organize it. One of them is creating a row of all 12 notes of the chromatic scale, because you're using all 12 of them, it's not going to define a key. It will probably be mostly atonal. Um, and, and to take that and apply certain rules to it, such as you can't reuse a, a, a note until you've used all of the others, which guarantees that it's going to be pretty much atonal. Some people follow those rules, some people don't. There's no single way to do it. And the serial concept that is, don't do this until something else happens, can be applied to all of the parameters of the piece of music, to rhythm, to, to uh, you know, the pitch in, the, in terms of the scale, the octave, to tone color, to which instruments get used. It can, it can, you, can, you, can, you can make rules endlessly, and those rules will have certain outcomes. And that is what serial music is. It's more of a mathematical concept than a musical one, frankly. And and what happens when you do things that way depends on the material. It's like anything else. It depends on what rules you follow and how you choose your, your musical materials. There can be serial pieces and or 12-tone pieces, which are extremely, extremely beautiful and quite tonal. Why? Because you can arrange your series of pitches, even though you're not repeating them, so that there are strong traditional tonal intervals between the notes, so that when you're using them, and especially when you use them in, in chords, which they call things like pitch aggregates and things like that, sound perfectly, perfectly traditional or close enough to it like jazz or blues, which they are. They have lots of, of foreign notes in the scale in them, but they don't sound to our ears, to modern ears, terribly harsh. So, so again, it, it's, it's a prejudice without much focus if you don't like 12-tone music. There are many, many, many modern composers who are absolutely witless hacks who wrote horrendous atonal and 12-tone music, but there were also geniuses who did it too. And so we're talking about the genius stuff. And there is no reason, I want to emphasize, that beginners should avoid it at all. There is nothing to avoid, nothing to be wary of, nothing, zippo, zilch. You're as well equipped to listen to it as anybody. And you sample. You just keep on listening, as I always say. You sample it, you like it, listen more. You don't like it, listen to something else. That's all it is. That's all it is. So, without further ado, let's get to it. Number one, Schoenberg, the fearsome Schoenberg. You know, Schoenberg's a wonderful composer because people say his music is difficult, and he wrote tonal and atonal music, and the tonal music is just as difficult as the atonal or 12-tone music. He was just difficult, period. Everything he wrote is different, and nothing sounds like anything else. He just, every work is slightly different from what you what came before. But we're going to start with his... Five Pieces for Orchestra. This is an absolutely brilliant and fascinating work. Um, and many of the group of composers around him, there were three, Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton Webern. And they formed what's called the Second Viennese School. The first Viennese school being Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. They were very modest. Anyway, this this kind of music, they they all followed the same trajectory, which was starting out sort of tonal and conservative and traditional, and then becoming atonal, but not atonal with a specific organizing principle, and then moving on to 12-tone versions of atonality or quasi-tonality. And, and the, the five pieces for orchestra are based in a style basically known as free atonality, meaning you just take it where your ear guides you. And they are so cool. Fabulous. One of them, one of them is called Farb and Colors. It, it, it consists entirely of slowly changing chords, devoid of melody. And these pieces were, they were extraordinary. They were written in like 1909, 1910. I mean, you know, Mahler was still going strong then and Strauss and all these, you know, traditional composers. And they're, they're, they're brilliant and fascinating and definitely worth a listen. And each one has a title and, and you can look at the titles and listen to the music and see what it does for you. After that, there's another Schoenberg work here, A Survivor from Warsaw. 
This is one of the most extraordinary gut-wrenching pieces ever. Schoenberg um, actually wrote the text himself. It's, it's a story, a monologue by someone who survived um, the, the Warsaw Ghetto um, to arrive at Auschwitz and see his comrades, you know, sent to the gas chamber. And, and it's, it's based on a true story, by the way, um, that Schoenberg read about. And he was so moved by it, he decided to set this thing. It's for a narrator who speaks and sometimes sings and a male chorus. Because the basic story is that the guy gets, gets beaten and so they think he's dead. And he's lying there and being ignored because they think he's dead. And he remembers, um, after he regains consciousness, the fact that, you know, these... These, these men that he was with are in line to go to the gas chamber and they all go singing the, the, the famous prayer, the Shema Yisrael, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he, there's an atonal setting of that at the end. And it, it's absolutely terrifying and moving, incredibly moving and powerful. And it shows you exactly what 12-tone music can do when it's, it's being used by a genius to express something which is inexpressible by any other means. You just can't imagine, you know, a nice tune to any of this music. I mean, the circumstances are too horrific, and and he's found a, a, a perfect medium to express the text. It's in English, by the way, the text, um, except for the, the Hebrew, for the, the song at the end. And my goodness, you will not be the same after you hear it. It's only about 10 minutes long. An extraordinary, extraordinary piece and one of the most moving and powerful of uh, pieces of music written in the 20th century, hands down. So, so it just goes to show, you know, don't, don't judge it yet. It's amazing. And one of the things that actually happened with this piece is that some avant-garde conductors like Michael Giel and, and others um, inserted it into um, performances of Beethoven's Choral Symphony, I don't have a tie with me, so I'm not going to tell you what it's called. And uh, so I'm not wearing the tie for it, but they did that just to sort of, you know, uh, make a commentary on how Beethoven's, you know, wish wish for all men being brothers um, did not come to fruition. And then, and then to go on with, you know, the end of the symphony, that, that that's quite a thing if they do it that way. Uh, very, very, very brave and thrilling piece of music. Next, Alban Berg's Wozzeck. Wozzeck is legendary. It's the first great atonal opera. Um, it is a terrifically moving story. It's about a poor soldier and his his wife, who is a call girl, and he has a son, and and he's poor and he's, he's downtrodden and he gets abused by everybody and his 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 girlfriend Marie. Um, takes up with the drum major in his in his unit, and he finds out about it, and he's made a mockery of, and so he stabs her to death, and then drowns himself, and so it's it's again it's one of those things where I mean yeah what other style of music are you could have set this particular story to, but wow what a powerful powerful piece, and it's not purely atonal. It has tonal elements. It's organized around the key of D minor, which gradually asserts itself as the plot continues. And the final the final interlude, there are orchestral interludes and things throughout, um, is, is in pretty straightforward D minor, a terribly sad lament after after Wozzeck drowns himself and Marie is dead. And the last scene is, it's got to be one of the most heartbreaking things you've ever, you've ever seen in your life. It's his son, a, a child, a young child. His, Wozzeck's son is playing with a hobby horse with his kids, just going hop, 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 hop. And, and the other kids run and say, wait, there's a dead lady out there. And one of them walks up to him and says, hey, you, you know, your mother's dead. But he's too young to understand. And they all run off to look at the body. And he stays there alone on the stage going hop, 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 playing with his hobby horse. And the music just stops in mid-phrase. And, and, you know, and you're just, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. But a great work. An incredibly great work. And if you're into these, you know, if you read John Steinbeck or any of these stories that are just so powerful and gripping and sad, intensely sad about, you know, man's inhumanity to man and the struggle of, of people who are poor. And it's, it's just unbelievably moving because the story is told with complete sympathy. 
it's an honest story. There's nothing alienated or or distanced about it at all. It's 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 completely gripping from first note to last with every single possible emotion explored um, and and made vivid by Berg and his style. It's it's astonishing, astonishing, really astonishing. So that's again, you know, you may not like opera. So if you're not an opera person, okay, don't do Wozzeck. But if you like opera, if you're into vocal music, if you can take an opera, you can take Wozzeck. It's not long. It's about an hour and 40 minutes long. And boy, oh boy, what a piece. So after Wozzeck, another Berg work, his three pieces for orchestra. See, all of these second Viennese people initially following Schoenberg's example wrote pieces for orchestra works. And the three pieces for orchestra are similar in style to the music of Wozzeck. They are freely atonal. Wozzeck is more organized in, in that sense. But it has three movements, the last one of which is a march. It's heavily influenced by Mahler, and particularly Mahler's Sixth Symphony. So if you know the Sixth, then this is a logical way to go. It even has, you know, Mahler's Sixth famously has three hammer blows of fate, or two, depending on which version you do, with a sledgehammer that goes crush in the finale and stomps on it. And, well, the hammer shows up in the last, the march of Berg's Three Pieces for Orchestra as well. A lot of the music is extremely beautiful, quite lyrical, and not, not at all difficult, more impressionistic and spacey than anything else. So that's a great piece to dip your toe into if you want some really yummy atonal orchestral music. Then we get to Webern. Now, Webern is the toughest of the three to listen to, but also in some ways the easiest because he's very brief. His music is really brief. He was he evolved a style in which every single note matters and in relationship to every other note, and he uses as few as he possibly can. So some pieces are less than a minute long. They're just a few seconds long. And all you hear is... That's it. You know, they're, they're, they, are, they are extraordinary works of, uh, well, sort of the ultimate in, in, in serial uh, conceptual brevity. I mean, what can I say? And people either like it or they don't like it, but it certainly won't take you long to listen to it. That's for sure. I think he's fascinating. There are times when I enjoy it. You know, I mean, other composers it really respected Webern because of his, his sincerity and the purity of his style. You know, Poulenc, I mean, Poulenc, right, who was, you know, as not like Webern as anyone humanly could be, was dazzled by Webern's music because he found it, he found it just stylistically so of a piece. It has extraordinary integrity. And you can hear that. You may not know what else it's doing, but the integrity you hear. So, so here are two pieces by Webern. First, the six pieces for orchestra, which are in the style of the five pieces by Schoenberg and the five pieces by Berg. They are even creepier, if that's possible. One of them, I mean, it's just, it, there's a funeral march that is one of the most terrifying pieces of music you've ever heard in your life. It's the longest one. It's in the middle. It's like number three or number four. I never remember which one, but you know it when you hear it. Others are, you know, less than half a minute and they just shimmer. I mean, they're, they're, they're remarkable. And there's a sequel to that too. Five pieces for orchestra. So if you like, you know, if you're interested in the, if you like the Berg stuff and you like the Schoenberg stuff, the Webern pieces, pieces, six pieces and five pieces are the way to go next. However, my next piece on the list is the six bagatelles for string quartet. Now these are really ethereal and 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 sometimes just gut wrenching and shocking, but but as few notes as possible. You listen to that sort of pointillistic style and see what it, see what it does for you. I listen to it more than once. Give it a few times. All six of them take about five minutes, so you can afford to do it a couple times. And listen, there are some pieces that you'll never get by anybody, not just these atonal guys. I mean, I, but I remember, for example, Schoenberg wrote a, a woodwind quintet. 
And I tried to get into that sucker. I listened to it every which way for days and days and days and days. And I got a CD that had index points. Do you remember index points? Some of the original CDs had them and the players had them. So you could get into the interior of a piece of music. And so this one had an analysis of the first movement, which was supposedly in classical sonata form. That is with a first subject, a second subject, a development, and a recapitulation. And so I said to myself, okay, it may be impossible to listen to it. It may sound like the, the woodwind players are getting strangled and tortured and squeaking and squealing. But if I get to know that exposition and then skip using the index function to the recapitulation, I'll at least recognize that material when it returns later in the movement. So I listened to the exposition about 450 times and I got my little remote and went forward in my index to the recapitulation. I didn't recognize a bloody note. Not a note. Nothing sounded familiar. Oh, why? I look at the notes, the analysis. Well, the recapitulation presents the initial tone row backwards and inverted and upside down. And I took the CD and I just frisbeed it out the window of my apartment. And that was the last I ever heard of Schoenberg's Wind Quintet. So you're in good company if there's something you don't like. But my point is that there is much, much more that you probably will. And so I'm trying to short circuit the process a little bit. And so anyway, the Weber and Bagatelles, okay, you may like it, you may not like it. Give it a shot, see what you think. Don't use it as a Frisbee. You can download it now. You can't Frisbee digits anyway, so it doesn't matter. Next, Stravinsky, Agon. Now, Stravinsky, in his, his late, late life, switched from tonal music, neoclassical music, to serial and atonal music. He became fascinated by it. And Stravinsky was one of those composers who had to be au courant. I mean, he always wanted to be at the forefront of everything. It meant a lot to him. And he saw that he was getting sort of left behind um, after his opera, The Rake's Progress. And so he began to evolve his own personal approach to atonality, most of which expressed itself in, in a series of late works, most of which are sacred music, religious works, which was very, very smart. Because sacred music works, it expresses its sacredness by being, that is, spacey, superhuman, by somehow being, you know, not traditional, you know, music with dance rhythms. I mean, being, being a little bit out there. And that is what, you know, gives you that sense of, of otherness that we tend to regard as spiritual or transcendental. So he was a smart guy to do it that way. But the first of his major works using atonal techniques um, was his ballet, Agon, it was called, um, which is a, a wonderful work, a fascinating work, and not at all difficult to listen to. It's it's very um, acerbic. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, uh, what's the word? Austere. That's the word. It's austerely written. Um, it doesn't have rich, cushy textures. You're not going to hear the firebird. You're not going to hear a huge orchestra like the Rite of Spring. But it is a ballet. So it has good rhythm. It always has rhythm. It has Stravinsky's typical clarity, his fresh and marvelous writing for wind instruments. It's vividly Stravinsky. So if you listen to Stravinsky, if you know him and you enjoy his works, um, the more you get to know him, the more natural that transition to the atonal style will be. And so Agon is, is a terrific work to dip your toe into as well, particularly if you've heard other pieces by Stravinsky. And the, the neoclassical ballets, particularly like Orpheus and Apollo and, and you know, those guys. And Agon is marvelous. So there you go. After that, now we're getting to the more avant-garde stuff. Things that are atonal and serial music. Yeah, it's atonal, but it's not serial and it's atonal in a special way. Penderecki, the great Polish composer, his Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima for String Orchestra. Now, what do you think a Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima is going to sound like? Yes, <laughs> that is what it sounds like. It's a very dense, terrifying piece, desperately, desperately sad and full of horror. And it's a texture piece. It doesn't have melodies. It doesn't have chords. It barely has rhythms. It has varying degrees of density in the string orchestra. Some of these densities consist of every possible note and every interval in between them. You know, just, just really scary sound. And that's what he's manipulating, sound masses. So there's nothing complicated about this. 
Nothing at all. I mean, it, it couldn't be easier, formally speaking. It's just a question of different degrees of, of, of density and different sounds that he could make with his string ensemble and usually varying degrees of, of screechy nastiness. I mean, it is what it is. Listen to it and see what you think. But I think when you know what the title is and then you listen to the music, whether you like it or not isn't really relevant. You'll understand it and you'll see the point. And last but not least, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful composer, Georgi Ligeti. He uh, was a Hungarian slash Romanian composer who wrote in a style that was his own. And it changed over his life. And it was, whether it was tonal or atonal or not, didn't really matter. And he wasn't too concerned about it. But the piece in question is called Lux Eterna. This is a piece for choir, for a cappella choir, meaning without instruments, just voices. And it was used in 2001 Space Odyssey. It's that crazy vocal music, you know, when the, when the, that, 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 you know, thing, you know, the, the large, the large rectangle thing is whizzing around through space and what's his name is landing on Jupiter and you hear these voices making this just, just ungodly music or godly music. I mean, looks eterna means eternal light. And, and he uses a, a technique called micro polyphony, which is simply, you know, the parts are divided up a billion different ways and everybody does their little bit for as long as they're supposed to. And the result, again, is simply a function of density. It's not about harmony particularly. It's not about rhythm, because there really isn't any. There are shades of dynamics and volume and different different textures and, and you know of sound and vertical vertical intensity based on how many people are singing and what they're singing and how loud they're singing it. And that's that's all it is. You just you just listen to it and you let it wash over and you think eternal light. It's an extraordinary piece, a beautiful piece, a very beautiful piece in my opinion. And and it sounds like unlike any other music in the world. And, you know, the point for a lot of these composers, especially in the 20th century, was to evolve their own idiom, their own way of speaking, their own way of using and writing music. And it was theirs and theirs alone. And, you know, some of us will respond to it and some of us won't. And some of them were just, like I said, were just faking it. I mean, they were, they were talentless, but they could think of formulae and apply them mindlessly and see what came chugging out. And others were compositional geniuses. Ligeti was a seriously brilliant composer, a wonderful composer. And Lux Eterna is one of his great masterpieces from a particular period in his life. And I think it also goes to show you that it's not about tonal or atonal. It's just about how fascinating and marvelous and listenable the music is and whether it speaks to you. And that depends to a certain extent on the music, but it also depends on whether you will let it speak to you. And I happen to think personally, that beginners are often vastly more open to these kinds of things than many, many more experienced listeners are, particularly those who are experienced in the standard classical canon, because they have expectations that this is what is great, this is what greatness sounds like, anything that doesn't sound like that must not be great, anything that requires me to really work or pay attention or, or stretch my boundaries is just annoying, whereas beginners they don't they don't come to it with those kinds of preconceptions and and i know that you are that kind of beginner i know you are and that this list is for you so keep on listening friends thank you so much for joining me take care